Right, so there once was a mouse. And this mouse was running through a wheat field. And the, the wheat was really high, and it couldn't find its way out. So he looked up at the trees, and there was an owl sitting there, a wise old owl. And uh, he asked the owl, can you tell me the way out of this wheat field? Because you can see which is the way out. And the owl said, I've got an idea for you. Why don't you grow some wings? Then you fly up, you can see your way out, and then you can go out. Wow, so that's a fantastic idea. But wait a minute. How do I grow wings? And the owl said, I only do strategy. I don't do execution. So we'll just keep that in mind as we go through this day. And um, my name is Phil Abernathy. I work in my company called Purple Kanda. I've been doing agile transformations for almost 12 years now and uh, done over about 15 of them from small size companies of 200 people to IBM at 400,000 people. I've led and guided them on this journey and what I'm going to share with you today is the learnings from, from all that. And the message is how do you craft a transformation? If you go in, where do you start? So there's a lot to cover. And um, I'm going to zip through the first two bits, which is all about the first thing, to T or not to T? Why do you need to trans transform at all? Then we'll talk about some principles, and then we'll run straight through it. So is, is it clear for you from there? Yeah? Maybe it's best if you, you know, just move a little bit, then you could see better just anywhere else. Yeah. OK, thanks. So the first thing is why change. Now, if you look at what's been happening in the world today, just take Sears, for example. Sears has got uh, it's been over a hundred years and they've gone from roughly the number one spot about 10 years ago to bankrupt today. They've dropped 97, 98, 9900 bankrupt percent. Whereas Amazon has gone up 2000 percent. So what's the difference? How come those two are such a... Everybody has the same technology, everybody has the same thing. What's been happening? There are three things that happen in the world today. The number one thing is the speed of change. Change has always been there. It's never been something special. Yeah? We've always been changing. But it's the speed of change that is amazing now because the threshold of technology has come down. For 10,000 bucks, you can set up and run the equivalent of an Amazon straight away, yourself. So anyone can compete. That makes, means customers have choice. These customers today can choose. So you have to decide, what do I do? The other point is that because of the technology complexity in the landscape, there is a scarcity of talent. So you've got to create a great place to work. Otherwise, you're not going to get great talent. And it's great talent that make great companies at the end of the day. Your product, your services are only as good as the people you have. So if you look at this and you say, OK, what do we have here? We have uh, customers, you have technology, you have talent. The only common denominator that differentiates a great company from a good or a bad company is what we call the way of working. Talent, you can pay, you can buy. Technology, you can buy. Products. You can make, you can copy. There's nothing special about it. So what is this way of working everyone's talking about? So if you talk about this, yeah, that differentiates the best from the not so good, yeah, everybody wants this. They want productivity. They want employee engagement. They want customer sat. And all this including outstanding results. This is all dependent on the way of working. Every single one. And it's been proven the difference between the great companies, whether it's uh, the new tech companies or the even old tech companies that are doing fantastically, it's that. But it's not, when you say way of working, everybody thinks, oh, it's this soft culture thing, and let's leave. No, it's not just the soft culture side. So what does it include? It includes the operating model, and it includes the org structure. It includes values and principles. It includes leadership and mindset. It includes practices and behaviors. So the way of working encapsulates a lot of these things. Yeah? 
And we're looking at this. We're not talking about 10% improvement that we're all got in our budgets every year. 15%, oh yeah, we're going to get better. We're talking about hundreds of percent improvement. We're talking about 10 times faster. That's the kind of productivity improvements you're seeing. And this is what you need, even from the banks today, if they want to stay competitive. There is no other way to stay competitive but working in this area. So now we've established the why. So companies have to realize first, do you need to transform or not? Do we have to change? Do we want to get better? Do we need to get better, faster, cheaper, and happier customers, happier shareholders, and of course, happier employees? So that's the setting that we have for the why. So we know the why now. We say, OK, we know the why. Now it's the what. So let's say you're the CEO of a company. OK, I need to transform my way of working. What have I got? Now, this is the dilemma the CEOs face. There's Six Sigma, there's Lean, there's Agile, there's design thinking. And underneath that, a mix of all these things that are thrown in there. There's Lean Six Sigma, there's Scrum Ban, there's Kanban. Everybody has put these things together. And some strange things have happened. People, I know companies that have been implementing Six Sigma. They find, mm, Six Sigma is not right for me, let's do Lean. Now, rather than getting rid of the Six Sigma approach, no, 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 let's call it Lean Six Sigma. So now they've mixed some other concoction and they've created that, which is fine. But look at the CEO now wanting to do a transformation. This is what they have. Luckily, companies in the last three years have realized this and we're starting to look at this. The umbrella of business agility, which is a set that works around all these different flavors, and what it provides is a set of common values. All of those things under the umbrella have the same set of values. They're human values. Trust, respect, honesty, working with openness, etc. The same principles, customer focus, fast iterative delivery, empowering your people, just to give you a few examples. Now, the practices are a buffet. Don't Fix your practices. They're just like a buffet. Today you're vegan, go and choose those, those dishes. Tomorrow you're, you've become non-veg, pick those up as well. Depending on the type of organizational unit that you want to transform, pick your practices. But your values and principles don't change. And when I talk organizational transformation, this is not IT. This is your sales department, your marketing, your legal, your finance, your, your business, whatever, supply chain, everything. So different practices are suited for different, uh, different parts of the business. And these practices actually change behaviors. Behaviors change your way of working. That's the cycle. Yeah? So <clears throat> now you know what. Now we're coming to the heart of it. Hmm. How do I do this? Where do I start? Yeah? Most of the organizations that I go to, very often I'm called in as a yeah, can we, can we fix it? Can we have a look at this? It's not been going so well, can you help? Now, a lot of the reasons there is because you're not set up for success. If you don't set up for success, even a project, and you all know that, the project is doomed to fail. So setting up right is the key to success of a transformation. And that brings me to the key principles of a transformation. There are three principles that I like to put up. The first one is decide on it. The second one is commit to it. And the third one is support it. Yeah? If you don't have these three principles, don't even start. Right? So what's decide on it? The first thing, and this is not just the boss. Look at that group of owls there. This is everybody in the senior leadership team for the group of people that want to transform must decide on it. They have to be behind it. Not just the boss says one day, oh yeah, let's do agile, let's go, let's bring in business agility and transform. They have to understand the impact. It's going to change the org structure, guys. Do you want that? Oh, now we're talking. It's a belief. If you say, no, no, please prove to me that this will work, then it's not a strategic decision. Strategic decisions is what big bosses are paid for, and they're paid because you have no proof. 
That's what a strategy is. Yeah? If, it's, if you know what it's going to be 100%, it's not a strategy, it's a fact. Yeah? So strategic decisions to transform are a belief. Hmm, that's difficult. That's what a strategic decision is. Now, you have to agree on one way of working for the whole org. Don't say, I'm going to do this in the sales department. Oh, and by the way, HR, you can do whatever you want. And uh, operations, you can do lean. Don't bother with these values and principles. Setting it up to fail from day one. Do you want to improve and get better as a company? Better, faster, cheaper? And they're all related. All these departments, as you know, are tightly integrated. You can't say, I'm not doing uh, the HR team. So I was called into a company in Melbourne almost eight, nine years ago. And I was told, we're going to do this transformation, and uh, we'd like you to help us. But we're only doing the BAs and the devs. The testers don't want it. Let's not involve them, because the manager is not supporting it. So can you transform this part? Yeah, hello. <laughs> it's not going to work. I said, call me when you're ready. Yeah? Almost nine years later, the call has come. Yeah? Because they realize that will not work. Yeah? So it is a strategic decision. The next one, you have to commit. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, 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 I commit. How's the management? Yeah, we're all committed. Now, you know immediately that's not commitment. The first one is each leader in the transformation space has to have goals in their KPIs set, not the transformation team. And what I see mainly with transformation, the transformation team is given the responsibility of the transformation. They actually, leaders that they're trying to transform, they're sitting on the fence. Oh, we, we'll see, when you come, we'll help you. Yeah, when you go, they're busy pushing back. Nobody holds them accountable. Hold the leaders accountable. Now, the second point was very important. Uh, Jeff Smith did this very well in Suncorp. Uh, when Alexander landed on the banks of the Yamuna, and uh, I think it was the Yamuna, maybe butchering that. So there was a whole Indian army on the other side. He was around 50,000 then because he'd walked all across the desert and, and reached, you know, the Indus Valley. And the Indian army, 500,000 with elephants, things they'd never seen before. His people were ready to leave. He sent his generals in the night to go and burn their boats because they were sailing down the river. They burnt the boats. His army had no other choice but to stand and fight. And they did defeat the Indian army. They were extremely tired after that and decided to push off, thank gosh. But that's what they did. And that's what the leaders have to do. There is no other way. Burn the boats. There's no, yeah, we're doing this. And by the way, we're also doing lean. And oh, yeah, if you want, you can decide to transform. No. That's not commitment. Yeah? And I have these hard discussions with executive teams, with the leaders. Decide. If you're not in favor of it, say so now and let's talk for another week. So as part of the transformation, I work with the executive teams to reach this commitment. These are workshops. These are workshops together with the senior executive team of the area that wants to transform for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Finally, hold them accountable. The most successful ones I've seen has always had one firing. If I go into a transformation that's been going on for a while, the first question I ask, how many people have been fired in your executive team or your senior leadership team? No one. So you think change, they're just completely embracing change? No, they will resist change. And you have to have at least one example normally, because there will be one or two bad apples that will not, they will commit and then they'll do something else. That behavior is not acceptable. That's what holding them accountable means. There's the door. Thank you very much. Off you go. So Jeff did this in Suncorp. After six months, nothing was changing in a certain area. He said to the leader concerned, out. What happened to the other seven leaders? Oh my God, immediately all of them were agile and they wanted to, please come in and help us transform. Just one, that's all you need. And don't accept the breakage of a commitment to a strategy. Companies never do this with anything else. If you decide on launching a new product, you don't say, okay, if you want, you launch it. The other department, maybe you want to do your project, you do it. No, you follow a product strategy. There's no optionality, right? So. 
then you have to support it. Now, I see many transformations fail in this area. So what is this all about? This is all about not funding it. No money. I'll give you one person, and they have to run the whole transformation. The bank I'm currently working in, uh, one of them, uh, in some part of the world, has got one transformation lead. He's been doing it for six months. He said, who's your team? No, it's only me. Oh, really? Just you? Yeah, just me. 3,000 people to be transformed. Now, look at that, cost neutral. You do not, if your transformation does not pay for itself, you've set it up wrong. Agile transformations should give you an ROI of at least twice or thrice. In the first year, it must be cost neutral. There's money in this, guys. You're not doing it for nothing. These are all businesses. If you can't spot the money, don't transform. You shouldn't be transforming. So people who think you're transforming just to get faster, forget it. You want to get better, faster, and cheaper. All three together, right? The second one, ADCA. It's a journey. Awareness, desire, knowledge, action, review. The old change management model. You have to take people on the journey. You can't force them with a stick. So awareness is so important. You must have the why explained to people. Why are we doing this? The business imperative. I was once called into a boss who asked me on their transformation journey, and he's, I asked him the question straight away, why are you transforming? He looked a bit offended, and he said to me, because I said so. Now, how do you think that went down? That obviously was my last discussion with him, and I didn't get the job. So, The next one, MMM, measure, measure, measure. If you don't measure, you don't know if the change is improvement or a backward step. You must measure your baseline, and you must measure up front. I've done a lot of transformations that have asked me, uh, can you prove to me after one year of the transformation that we've gone better? Yeah, of course, I can show some productivity, I can show a few other, but what's the baseline? Nobody measured the baseline because the measures were not even existent. Who had cycle time? Who had throughput? Who had customer engagement? Who had employee engagement measured in a normal company? Very few, but that's what you're improving. So if you don't know it, you can't prove whether your change is improvement or not. So please measure from day one. And the last one, it's a journey. You have to persevere. You can't do it for two months and say, oh, it's very difficult, let's stop. And now let's do lean. Oh, let's do something else. The next flavor of the month. This is a journey for years. And it's a continuous journey. So it's going to take you time. So that's the, how am I doing for time? Ooh, I'm two minutes ahead of time. You can see my little time check at the top there. <clears throat> so. Now we're coming to the most important part. So you've got the principles laid down. How do you do it? How do you transform? So I've created a little framework. It's an ugly little picture, but we'll uh, work on that later. I've called it the beam, the stream, and the teams. These are the three things you have to focus on. Yeah? The first thing is the beam. What is the beam? This is the bar. This is the, the setting that you're transforming to. So the beam consists of defining what your values and principles are. What is this change in your company? Every company is different. You can't take a cookie cutter and say, from your company, I'm going to put it here. Because culture is top down. Culture is based on the, the senior leader's philosophy, the senior leader's presence. That will cascade down. So you have to tailor this picture for your company and state what it is before you start. Otherwise, halfway through, everybody will put their own stuff in here, and you've again got a goulash. Yeah? So now let's look at the values and principles. The values of agility are all based to create one thing, psychological safety. Google wrote an Aristotle report which is 10 years in the making, where they studied 180 teams or something like that, and they found out what makes a great team. What's the difference between a high-performing team and a low-performing team? 
and they took all the measures possible and it wasn't where they're located. It wasn't the IQ of the team. It wasn't the cultural fit of the team. It wasn't co-location. It was only one thing, psychological safety. Do the team members feel safe to talk, to challenge, to ask, to think? That doesn't mean democracy. They're still a decision maker, but it means having the freedom and safety to ask. To do that, you need trust, respect, transparency, and authenticity. These are the four must-have values. You can call it different things. You can call it honesty. You can call it something else. But if you're not committed to this, don't even start your transformation. Now, let's talk about the values. The first, let's talk about the principles. These are the values. The first one is focus on the customer at all times. This could be an internal customer or an external customer. The next one, collaborate. Now, I see this so very often. Oh, yeah, we, we should collaborate as a principle. Collaborate actually means challenge and commit. This is the difference in Amazon. This is the difference in Google. You challenge as much as you want, but at the end of the day, someone makes the decision. And then, whether you agree with it or not, you follow that decision. Otherwise, you start backstabbing people. Yeah, 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 you give this, you know, what is called the kiss of yes. Yes, yes, yes. And you go out of the room, and it's absolutely no, no, no. So you have to allow to people to commit and decide fast. You will never know everything up front. The next one, break work down into small pieces. Try it small, iterate fast, simple, keep it simple. Don't take three months to come out with a prototype. Six months to do a business case. Forget it, you're on another planet. I'm talking weeks, one week, two weeks, and start. Measure, listen, analyze, learn, improve. You have to measure as you're going. If you look at the lean startup, you look at anything else, it's all about this fast measurement. Because what you did here, you'll only know whether it works if you measure on the other side. Otherwise, how did it go? What's the point of doing small and fast if you don't know where you're going? Next one, pull work from a single prioritized backlog that's prioritized by the customer. This means don't work on six things at the same time. Multitasking is the biggest lie. It's the biggest waste of productivity. Now, if you don't have anything to do, so you, you have to know what your limit is. They call it whip limit. I can do two things at a time. That's fine. You don't have to only do one. But a team should be working on one project. Finish it, get it done, pull the next one. Yeah? Small, persistent, cross-functional teams, preferably co-located. This is the magic. Now, this small has been around in Agile from a long time, and people talk about two pizza teams. Yeah, you must have heard of it. Two pizza, if you can feed the team with two pizzas, that's the right size. So what's happened now? Now I've got teams that are 10 and 12. Yeah, yeah, it's a two pizza. Two pizza team, the guys won't even, they'll starve. Yeah, they'll become six pizza teams. No, small means two pizza teams. How much is two pizza team? Four people. I'm building the fastest product at one or two clients now in three weeks, four weeks, delivering complete end-to-end -end solutions, full-stack solutions, in three weeks with a team of four. The entire Mac, iMac software, the OS operating system for the Mac, is built, run, and operated by 30 people. That's it. The entire lot. So, next one. Your org structure that sits on top of your teams must be lean, well-designed, and simple. I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a moment. And you should design it bottom-up, not top-down. Hey, I have a leader. Let's find some people for them. No, it's the other way around. Design your teams first, and then find out what's the minimal span of control you want to manage that, top-down. That's it. You get these seven core principles right. This is agility in your entire company. Sales, finance, marketing, IT, it does not matter. This is it. Yeah? So <clears throat> that's the beam. You have to create a blueprint. You have to find out what the content is. And you have to have some baseline measures. You have to do that before you start your transformation. In a month. This is how long it takes. Don't wait to get it right. 
This will not take you too long, even for a big bank, if you're talking 20,000 people, one month maximum. That's the beam. Now we're going to talk about the streams. The streams are how do you use that? How do you actually transform? There are four streams that you have to have. The first stream is the operating model, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The second one is the capability that you have to lift of the people because it's a different way of working. It's not the same way of working. Yeah? So you have to learn it. That's training, coaching. Then there's the org model and there's the change management. Change management, we all know. Awareness, desire, knowledge, you have to have change management. Org model, really? This is the figure I get. You really want to change my org model? What has that got to do with transformation? Nobody. Who changes org model? Oh, that's done somewhere by HR and a few other people. Nobody else is involved. This is a key point, and I'm going to walk through that, because this is where we found the biggest issues in most of the transformations. And this led me to the maze. So originally, in the early years of the 80s and 70s, organizations were vertically structured. HR, finance, department one, department two, department three. Around the 90s, we started getting horizontal uh, countries in. We got regions, we got sectors, we got channels. Now we're living in the matrix. In the 90s, something strange happened. In the 90s, it came out from uh, um, business schools, the concept of KPI management. So what is a KPI management? KPI management is, if my innovation is not working well, let's make a head of innovation. Oh, services, let's make a head of service. Oh, how about uh, a head of productivity, vice president of productivity? How about uh, main vice president of maintenance support? And it goes on and on and on and on. With vice presidents all over, they have an army of people under them, and in the middle is Bob. Bob is the person doing the work. That has not changed. So we have built an inverted pyramid on top of Bob. Now you see who's responsible for this. Who's resp I've got one company I worked with. I was shocked when they have appointed. They were not doing well in Europe, in certain country in Europe. Yeah. They've got a country manager. They've got a sector manager. They've got a region manager. They've got a product manager. They've got a sales manager. And they've got a channel manager in Europe, in one city, one area. Let's take it as Holland. Guess what they do because gross margin was not good. Vice president of gross margin. And it's to that extent, because there is one person who didn't have a job, senior vice president, so let's park the fellow here and give him or her some 10 people to manage. That's the maze. Try operating in this now. Talk about complexity. That brings us to the madness. The madness is how work flows through the maze. Imagine this maze now. Now you have to pass. And this is the red line is the way it's documented and put in the cupboard. But that's not how work happens. Work happens with the yellow line, which is another more convoluted approach. If you really want to get stuff done, you take the little dotted line. You know who to call. You call Bob, and Bob will fix it for you. Isn't that how it works? That's how we all work. And then what do we do? Oh, we automate this madness. We get SAP, and we pour it in, like liquid cement. And then you're stuck. When you're configuring it, it's nice, and then it hardens, completely solidified. This maze, now try changing this. This is what we walk into and say, let's transform. Yeah? And then, of course, we need these maze runners. These are project managers. I pity them, really, men and women, whose sole job is to run this maze. I went to one of the banks in, in Australia. 102 developers. How many project managers do you think they had? 102 developers. 92 project managers. This is just unheard of. What are they doing? Yeah, program managers, portfolio managers, program, son of program managers, project managers, iteration managers, the whole stack running this maze. So if you do not change your org structure, forget it. Most companies are like this, complex in today's world. Now, there are companies that are not complex, in which case that's fine. Yeah? And then you get the metrics. Everybody's got their KPIs, their dashboards, their outcomes, their goals, their targets. There's no way. So behind this agility, 
And we started in a number of transformations to just do this. Do the training. You do your stand-up. You do your sit-down. You do your retrospective. We trained everybody. We sent them on coaches. We put all the coaches in. Nothing changed. Why do you think nothing changed? Because of this dark dimension behind it. If you do not tackle the dark dimension, forget it. Nothing will change. So you have to tackle org structure, operating model, and the talent. Because in that maze, you will have poor talent. People who've been in their jobs for 10 plus years, they're completely stagnated. They're baked into it like SAP. So there's no fresh thought. There's no fresh thinking. Yeah? So back again, you have to change your org model. You have to lift the capability, change out the talent. Our rule in most of the transformations I now do is 50% new talent in every team. This does not mean firing 50%. This means rotation. Bring in new blood. Take this person and put them there. Take that person and put them there. You should get at least 20% fresh blood in. Now, I worked with one bank, which is a community bank, and they told me they are 30%. I've devised a little method. It's called the BMI. You know the BMI? Now, this is the organizational BMI, Bureaucracy Mass Index. It's an index that you can calculate how much of fat is there in your organization. It's based on the ratio between enablers and doers. It's quite easy to calculate. And it should be around 8 to 12 percent. Most of the large companies are in the region of 30 to 50 percent, 45 percent, 40 percent, unheard of. So I calculated a BMI ratio for this group of 35. So 35 minus 10, you've got 25 percent fat. That means? People who don't need to be in their positions. Saving $42 million. This is what I meant by cost neutral. But I was called into the CEO, private conversation. We are a community bank, and we will not fire a single person. That will go down very badly in the press. We cannot fire. That's good. That's a great statement to work with. Now we said, okay, let's take the numbers. How, much, how many people do you hire a year? Well, 200. How many people retire a year? Another 100. How many people are nearing retirement that can take the package? Yeah, there's another 50. How many contractors do you have? 700. I gave him a picture in one day of how he could save that 32 million without firing, or 42 it was, without firing a single person, just through stopping recruitment, moving people around, and cutting the contractors. So you don't have to fire people for this, but you have to get rid of the superfluous jobs, because every additional job creates work for four other people who are productive. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is what you do in the org model. You do a chair design that's optimal. Then you do a boss design. This is the bottoms on seats. These are the chairs. These are the bottoms. Yeah. So you first design the chairs, then decide who has the capability to sit on that chair. It's not everybody. Then you do your talent assessment and decide who sits on these chairs. On this side, operating model, you have to look at your budgeting, your governance, your measures, your rewards, your management system, and risk management. That's what operating model is, because this is what drives your company. The person who has the budget will call the shots. If you don't optimize that and align it with your new transformation model, you're not going to change. You'll still be the same. And lastly, you have to lift the capability. You have to train them. You have to coach them. This is the three streams, the four streams that I talk about, change management, org model, op model, and capability. That's what you need to transform. That's the streams. Now let's look at the teams. Never make the transformation team responsible for the transformation. The transformation team is only as a service. Hold these leaders accountable and the teams. Have four streams, org model, op model, capability, and change as a service. Offer it as a service so these leaders can pull it. Give me advice on how to change. Give me advice on the op model. You may need to standardize the operating model. 
capability. Help me with training. Help me with coaching. Don't push it. Let them pull it and hold them accountable. That's the only way it'll work. This transformation has to be a leader-led transformation. It's not an army of consultants coming in. In my company, I have maybe five or six people. That's it. I don't go in with an army. I train the leaders in there to do this. And I don't mean these leaders. I mean these leaders. The leaders in the org. It's their responsibility, not the transformation team. So one of the people asked me, so transformation team, how can we measure our progress? I said, you don't measure any progress. These people should be recording the, pro the progress. They should be reporting progress, not you. You're just a service. You can say how many people I've trained, but that's not progress. So <clears throat> the other thing they ask is, what should I measure? Can you give me a set of measures? My question to them is, what do you want to improve? Do you want to improve productivity? Do you want to improve employee set? Do you want to improve customer set? Do you want to improve quality? Why have you transformed? The reason for your transformation will define the measures that you use. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I've got five core leadership capabilities here. I'm not going to go into the details of it. The top three are at the heart of every leader's toolkit. And they are not taught this. This is the problem. They go on leadership training courses where they are taught about what they should do, not how they should do it. Yeah, you should be like Nelson Mandela and have empathy and, ha yeah, hello. What do I do on Monday? And how do I do it? Yeah? On Monday, you have to create clarity of purpose. You have to control without controlling. Yeah? Look at that word there. Oh my God, Phil used control in an agile presentation. Of course. Control, you tell a manager you have to give up control. And I hear so many people saying, oh, we're a squad, just leave us alone. We're not giving you a plan. We're not giving you anything. We're agile. Really? Complete misunderstanding. And then we wonder why managers are scared of agile. Of course they're scared. You have to have control, but without controlling. And there's a technique to do that, without micromanaging. Design for flow. This is how do you design your org and how do you design the processes around, because that is not a once-off job. So what happened, this happened in one of the companies I worked with, so I've learned all this through bleeding and making mistakes. So I've fallen down every step of the way and made 100 mistakes and still have 100 more to make. So did the design and then walked away. Fantastic, org design is done. What do you think is happening now? New people are coming into the company, they've reorganized it. You look back, six months later, there's the maze again forming. It's like those creepers that grow in your house, you know? Before you know it, they're creeping up everywhere. Every day you have to go and trim. So you have to teach the leaders how to do that. And of course, this is their main job. How do you identify people with the right values and principles to join your company? How do you define it? What, do you, what are you searching for? We all know you should now look for attitude, not aptitude. Aptitude you can change. Attitude you can't change, very hard. So how do you ask the questions? If you ask, oh, what's your attitude? And that's not the question in the interview. <laughs> you will get the wrong answer. Yeah, I have a good attitude. Oh, very good. You're hired. <laughs> so you have to have a way of getting this. And finally this. In Amazon, they have one key measure for all managers. And it's called decision velocity. That's the speed at which managers make decisions. The date the decision comes in to the date the decision is made. If you wait for 100% of the data to make the decision, you're too late. You have to make the decision before that. And that means making a decision with uncertainty. Oh my God. So we've talked about the streams, the beams, and the teams. Just a few minutes on the challenges, the top three challenges. That's all I'm going to talk about. The first thing. Here's the org structure. The CEO is sitting here. The teams are here. Where do you think the collaboration effectiveness is? Is it higher at the top or higher below? Do you think this picture is right? Of course it's not right. That's what it is. The teams at the top do not collaborate by default. The most dysfunctional teams are executive teams in terms of collaboration. That's why you have the problem down below. And Satya Nadella has put this so well. An inch of difference at the top is a mile of difference at the bottom. 
Because now everybody down below is busy fighting, trying to solve the difference here. Because here there's false harmony. Yeah, 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 very good, yes. And they go and they tell their people, over my dead body. And there it goes, the fight goes. And these people are expected to fight. That's why we struggle with big day planning, prioritization. I see armies of people, 50 people in a room doing prioritization. Why? It's because these people don't agree. That's the reason you need big room planning. The reason you need safe is because these people don't agree. You do not need safe if they agree. So that's my biggest challenge. The second one is making the hard talent calls. You will have people who are not capable. Call it. If you don't call it, you're done. And the last one is you do need help. I've got so many teams that are start the transformation. They pull in a few people, a few graphic people as well, and they start designing the agile curriculum, the agile content, they start making the decks, they, it's all about marketing, it's all... They've not worked Agile before. So get people who really know the stuff to help you because this is new, yeah? Don't try to do a lot of it yourself, but it's very hard to find that. And you won't find volumes, that's the point. <clears throat> and this is the last question. Are we there yet? When is the transformation over? Is the transformation over? So what do you all think? Is, could the transformation of a thousand people be over in a year? Give me a number, yes or no? No. Two years? How about three? Still no? When is it over? It's a journey, it's continuous improvement. But be very careful. You do want to switch off your transformation team. You don't want them there forever. So you have to operationalize your transformation team as soon as possible so that is in the normal way of working. So you want a great way of working, a great place to work, great talent brings great success. And that's the loop you're chasing. And that's how I feel after most of the transformations. So thank you very much. How's that for timing? Good? Three minutes. Okay. Are there any questions? Ah, control without controlling. <clears throat> that sounds interesting, doesn't it? So, <clears throat> you have two levers to control without controlling. Your first lever is the measures. If you look at anybody monitoring a dashboard or any leader, they are monitoring their measures. If it's in a nuclear submarine, they're monitoring the dials there. They're not micromanaging the person behind the levers. They're standing back and they're reading the high-level picture. You must have your key driving metrics in place. That's your first lever for control without controlling. And this is not your budget. I see so many managers just managing on budget or sales target or something else. That's just one slither because what you measure will improve at the cost of something else. So you have to balance your metrics. The second lever is the wisdom of the crowd. So you have your measures and you have the wisdom of the crowd. You must listen to your people, walk the floor, go around, talk to them. You will hear what's actually happening. That is control without controlling. You don't have to micromanage them. Don't wait for the report to come to your desk. Forget the report. Walk and go and see what's happening. I think there's time for one more. Okay. Oh, you, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what's the typical uh, career journey for them? You know, you have people who become agile trainers, coaches, internal, right? Um, <clears throat> then, do they actually move to a new organization because the transformation is done? So that, that's a that's a good that's a good question. We had a coaches uh, workshop on Sunday, and one of the co one of the big questions at the end is what next for coaches? Because coaches will not be needed. You don't need coaches all the time. The leaders should become the coaches. You need to push off. If you can't figure out where you're going next, yeah, whether it's to do more coaching or not, then it's, it's, uh, it's up to you as a, as a person. You can go within a line management function or you can continue. So I look at coaching in two models. You've either got the life coaching model or you've got the sports coaching model. In the sports coaching model, there will always be a team that needs a coach. If you leave Man United, go to Chelsea. 
You leave Chelsea, go somewhere else. Yeah? Man City is always there. You know, if that's one, one journey. The other journey is you, you leave and find another role. So if you want somebody to give you a career, then that's not to say, okay, you're a transformation team, you'll be there forever. Thank you all very much and wish you all the best. Thanks.